start it again. So I think we, we have about another hour, but um, I'm happy to stay you know, as long as people want to if the discussion continues. And also, um, no box will be selling some books, which I'll be happy to uh, autograph if anybody wants that. And let me also mention that on my website, I have some professional papers that are available for free download if you are interested. The book kind of lays out the whole framework and it's filled with case studies. Um, some of the papers that I have are more recent and they kind of update and refine the therapy approach. So the website is the centerforoptimalliving.com and uh, under the media tab you can find some papers there that you might find interesting. Um, let me also mention at the beginning, um, Inez alluded to the Center for Optimal Living. And let me just tell you what that is to give you some context. And, and maybe throughout the discussion of harm reduction and harm reduction therapy, um, we can, if you want to, you know, we can refer back to what we're doing at the center. So as I said in my opening, I uh, discovered harm reduction as a framework 21 years ago and began, became very interested in thinking about the therapeutic implications of the harm reduction frame. And I began, I wrote the book and then I began getting invitations to train. So the first one was in uh, 2005, I went to Lebanon. But the training invitations then um, encouraged me and supported me and required me to begin developing a training. And so that was, has been a very valuable part of my own development. About four years ago, a little over four years ago, I decided that there should be a home for this har integrative harm reduction therapy in New York City. So that's really what the Center for Optimal Living is. It's a platform for advancing the work. And we do that with a comprehensive therapeutic uh, treatment center. We have a team of clinicians that are all doing this work. We offer highly individualized treatment, uh, tailoring plans that can include individual therapy, group therapy, family work, and couples work. And we have a whole group of collaborating uh, psychiatrists and doctors and complementary practitioners so we can put together very comprehensive treatment plans. <clears throat> and the harm reduction group is a very interesting thing when you get a bunch of mixed folks together, you know, pursuing different goals. We also have a, a professional training center in conjunction with the New School University. So in a way, the center's mission is to promote the work but also to showcase it. So we've developed a center that can be replicated elsewhere and so there are a number of places around the world that are setting up similar kinds of centers. And Inez and I are talking about, you know, me supporting her in doing that at Nobox um, because they're really wanting to, they are in the process of developing a very similar kind of um, treatment center. So that will give you some context, uh, a broader context for what we're doing. So let's get into the work. Um, the clinical work, clinical applications more specifically. <clears throat> I think Inez said this at, at, in her opening, but I, cons I consider integrative harm reduction psychotherapy as bringing together a blend of therapeutic interventions, psychodynamic, cognitive, behavioral, experiential, body-oriented, medical, um, within a harm reduction frame. So I think about the principles as framing the helping relationship. And just to cut to the chase, in a way, I think that the, the most, the clearest therapeutic expression of these harm reduction principles is an emphasis on therapeutic alliance, on engagement, alliance, and relationship. And I think that that's what's been left out of traditional treatment. So when we think about the complexity of these patients, the variety of these patients, the demands that they make on us, it seems to me that how we establish a, a, a therapeutic context that will attract patients and then how we engage them 
and keep them engaged is really a primary fundamental challenge of clinical work. And I think the harm reduction frame lends itself to that. So another definition, just to get us back into what we're talking about, is the International Harm Reduction Association, which was really the original home for harm reduction um, in, I believe, 1990, they coined the term. Policies and programs which attempt primarily to reduce adverse health, social, economic consequences to individual drug users, their families, and communities. This is, so one of the things that jumps out here is that harm reduction is a holistic uh, philosophy. It's not just about the individual. It's also about protecting families and communities. So there's an interesting dynamic tension. So for example, when we think about syringe exchange, we are giving people clean syringes. That syringe is helping protect that drug user against potentially getting infected. It also helps that drug user uh, protect that drug user's family and friends against potentially getting infected. And it helps protect the community because it's, you know, people aren't leaving contaminated syringes uh, out, you know, which can potentially infect others. So it's a very holistic um, philosophy that wants to sort of see how harm can be reduced to every potential um, person in, in our system. As I said, I think it's primarily a philosophy and <clears throat> Alan Marlatt coined the term compassionate pragmatism. And this is before evidence-based practice became such a buzzword. Harm reduction was talking about being pragmatic. The question is what works? Let's stop being ideological and wedded to what worked for me, but let's think in a, in a global sense about what actually works to help patients. That's the pragmatic part. And what it presumes is that drug use and other risky behavior are part of the human experience, whether we like it or not. We may not like the fact that our, our uh, fellow citizens are engaging in risky behaviors, but it's a fact of life. And the question is how can we best respond to that risk and help people reduce the risk? Uh, another part of that, which is really where compassion comes in, is that in order to be helpful to people, we need to be able to understand their experience. We need to understand the complex meanings and relationship and attachments that people have to their problematic substance use. This is also um, fundamentally an, an approach that's about respect, about human rights, about accepting you know, the diversity of people's choices and the rights of humans to make choices that may be different from our own choices. So it's fundamentally also uh, a philosophy that's based on human rights and human dignity. This is the fundamental shift I think I mentioned before, which is from abstinence only to any reduction of drug-related harm. It's a simple but profound shift in emphasis. So rather than trying to get people to stop doing dangerous things, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, I mean that can be a good goal, a lofty goal, but pragmatically for many people it may be more realistic to think about how we can help people reduce the harmful aspects of these risky behaviors. So then, as I said, this then um, enables us to have a harm reduction umbrella which can support people in reducing risk, safer use, reduced use, moderate use, and abstinence. And I might say also, and this is something that I think is a bit controversial in the harm reduction world, to my mind, addiction per se is harmful drug use. Addictive drug use, as we heard before, is by definition harmful. Continued use despite harmful consequences. So the treatment of addiction should fall under that harm reduction umbrella. 
So we may start with a clean syringe, which is going to help people protect themselves, uh, their health, and their life. But the harm reduction ambition is to reduce the harm to the greatest extent possible, which would include treating their addictive drug use. Uh, some people think about um, simply giving a syringe. You know, that's a limited harm reduction intervention, but harm reduction as an overarching philosophy, I think, bridges to addiction treatment. Uh, one of the, the slogans here that's, that's part of the movement is any positive change, which was coined by one of the first and most influential harm reduction programs in Chicago called the Chicago Recovery Alliance, I should say in the world. And it's very consistent with the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Oh, and by the way, you know, when we're talking before about um, treatment programs that are not helpful and effective to many patients, let's also consider how we as clinicians and we as treatment providers or treatment programs can actually hurt our patients. So another part of harm reduction is really confronting ourselves and asking us, are our clinical practices helping or hurting? When we discharge a patient for using drugs who's come to us for help, is that actually a helpful intervention? And, and, and you know, that may challenge a lot of institutions to rethink their institutional policies, and that's a good thing. You know, so I would invite everyone in the room to bring these questions up at your clinical meetings, in your courses, you know, with your directors. You know, with this given patient, is this going to be more helpful to keep the patient in treatment while they're using or discharge them as a clinical intervention? Um, there's a wonderful organization called LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. It's a bunch of current and retired law enforcement professionals who have gotten together, I think it's an international group, um, to lobby against the drug war, essentially, against prohibition. And the director, executive director, I asked what his definition of harm reduction was, and this is interesting. He said, my understanding of harm reduction is that we want to, A, provide help to folks misusing drugs, and B, do no further harm through punitive policies. So he's also extending it to a policy level. Are our drug laws actually helping, or are they doing more harm? Um, so that's an interesting, I mean, an important question for us to ask. Where he said, in short, limit the harm they do to themselves and limit the harm to what they do to themselves. We shouldn't be adding harm to the harm that people are already struggling with uh, from their problematic drug use. Addiction trailblazer Stanton Peel, he's written you know, 10 or 15 books on addiction. Um, he's been a wonderful trailblazer from the 1980s. He says, you can try for abstinence or not, but let's protect your life and the lives of those around you. Then he says, and I think this is a bit more radical, what makes us a harm reductionist is that we're non-judgmental about the approach to substance use pursued. As a, as a route to contentment or meaning. It's time for us to remove that chip from our brains. I think what he's talking about is the judgmentalness. You know, we clinicians are not in the, pos we're not in the position of being moral judges of our patients' behavior. We're in the business of trying to help. Another key principle, and we were all taught this in our first counseling class, so it seems so simple, but so profound, to start where the person is. What does that really mean in clinical practice? Um, I actually was giving a talk several years ago, and the, the, the director, uh, chairman of the Department of Psychiatry was talking to his vice chairman, and he said, what does that really mean, to start where the patient is? Um, I think what it means is that we need to get our agendas out of the way. We need to focus on our own agendas and clear them out of the way so that we can actually listen 
to the patient. Who is this person? What are their needs? What is what are they? You know what how what, what are their unique qualities? Their unique needs? Their unique strengths? So that we can actually develop a treatment or offer a, an intervention that will start where they are, rather than asking them to come to our agenda. So we're tailoring interventions. Another concept that has been used in the field is the idea of lowering the, sh the threshold. Wherever the patient is ready to begin the process of positive change is where we want to lower the threshold to so that, that they can step on or step over that door. Um, I also like to say that we don't need to know the outcome to help people begin the journey. So it's really about partnering with people in a supportive way wherever they are ready to begin that journey. So we shift to any positive change. We start where people are, which enables us to create relationship. And then we begin moving in a positive direction in small incremental changes. Sometimes we get dramatic change, which is wonderful. But if we think about you know, how a process of positive change unfolds, it's generally in small and sometimes imperceptible positive changes. So we could think about, OK, what are you doing right now? And what, if anything, are you willing to do to move in a positive direction? It might be just gathering information. It might be observing yourself more clearly. It might be engaging in a group where you're going to begin to dialogue with other people. So any positive change, any small incremental step is going to be you know, uh, accepted and applauded as a potential success. And think about how small changes build on small changes, whether it's with the substance use or the co-occurring issues. So we can think about any positive change in small increments in any relevant issue that's relevant to the problem behavior. And finally, collaboration is a core uh, principle of all harm reduction work. I think that this may be a key shift from an old, and this is sort of old in many areas of our lives, kind of authoritarian, prescriptive model of helping. You know, we're doctors, we're professionals, we're experts. We're supposed to know what's best for the patient, right? And frequently, we like to tell the patient what's best. Um, but with a growing, educated you know, community of consumers, with multiple possible doctors to go to and, and approaches to seek out, it seems to me we're all shifting to a different model of helping, which is much more collaborative. We want to invite patients to become educated consumers, to be actively involved in their clinical care, to be collaborators in the, in the, in the therapeutic process. So it's a real shift from authoritarian to collaborators, which doesn't mean that we don't have our expertise. Of course, we've got expertise of years of clinical practice and training and life experience, and we bring all of that to the table. But now we're also seeing that drug users have their expertise as well. They know more about the drugs they take than we do. They know more about risk frequently than we do. Or at least we can collaboratively take that question on about risk. Um, <coughs> this is a quote that I, I love. It's because it, it kind of illustrates how these ideas are shared around the world. This is from a French colleague uh, who's the head of the Addiction Federation in France, um, a man named Dr. Alain Morel. He says, Initially, this is about collaboration. Initially, initially, it's necessary that the subject be aware of his acting power. That is, his capacity to act on his condition and to make choices. I think we in the States maybe would think of self-efficacy as a, as a comparable concept. But that we want to support the patient in developing the power, the capacity to act 
on their problematic behavior. And he says in more direct terms, this means that in addictology, the services can only be collaborative. Suggesting a collaborative relationship is one that is inherently empowering to the patient and supporting the patient in feeling like they can act on uh, their problems. So part of the way you see that in, in harm reduction settings is harm reductionists go into communities or deal with, with individuals and want the individuals in the communities to participate in creating the services. You know, so this is, I mean, one of the questions I, or one of the things I said to you earlier is I'm bringing my experience and my ideas from the United States. I don't know exactly how these can be applied and integrated into the Philippines, into your context. Um, I'm sure that there are universal issues that we share in common, and then there are very specific differences that, um, you know, that, that, that exist in your culture that require these things to be adapted and, you know, in, in ways unique to your setting. So, harm reduction, it seems to me, we can think of as, you know, given these principles, as an engagement strategy. Around whatever intervention we're offering, we're supporting people in beginning a process of positive change, wherever they're ready, willing or able to start that process. We offer a positive supportive healing relationship with healthcare. So it's not just about that intervention. You know, you as a, if you're a, uh, a health outreach worker, if you are a physician, if you are a counselor, if you are a nurse, um, around whatever service you're developing, you're also developing a, a potentially therapeutic relationship and a potentially healing relationship with healthcare in general. And supporting people in developing a, a positive, self-caring, healing relationship with themselves. As you know, many drug users have been, have had so many experience of failure, of rejection, um, uh, being told that they're, you know, worthless, that just the fact that we care enough to engage them and invite them into care on their own terms can be a powerfully therapeutic uh, relational experience. We're offering a different kind of relationship. And uh, we expand on that when we talk about therapeutic process. This is my wonderful uh, assistant director at the center, Dr. Jennifer Talley. Uh, talks about harm reduction therapy in this way. It's a self-empowering way to help people to build inner resources and awareness to work toward positive change goals. So often around the substance use, people need to develop inner resources that they lack. For many clients, the goals of therapy may include reducing risky behavior, learning moderation strategies, or pursuing abstinence. The key here is that goals are developed and attained incrementally and in collaboration. We already said that. Empowering people to make positive changes using awareness and compassion. She, by the way, is a, is a very strong mindfulness practitioner. So she's brought mindfulness groups and um, uh, mindfulness workshops that kind of infuse our approach. We integrate mindfulness into cognitive, behavioral, and psychoanalytic uh, inter interventions. So, why do I love harm reduction? You might have imagined that I love harm reduction. Um, it's individualized. It honors diversity. It's compassionate. It's pragmatic. It's evidence-based. It values curiosity. Rather than presuming we know when we, when we meet an individual, we need to be curious about who they are and what they're bringing. It's collaborative, it's systemic, it respects personal choice, personal responsibility. We want to engage people in taking responsibility for being part of the therapeutic project. It's egalitarian, it's integrative, and it works. It's evidence-based. Um, on that score, I should say, 
the harm reduction psychotherapy itself does not have much direct evidence because until recently in the United States, the National Institute of Drug Abuse said if you want to fund your research, don't call it harm reduction. That's shifting, we hope. But as you'll see, the elements, the therapeutic tasks of integrative harm reduction therapy all have evidence to support them, beginning with Therapeutic Alliance, which has very powerful evidence to support its efficacy. So let's get into interventions. As I said, a philosophy and set of strategies. So public health interventions are what most people think of as harm reduction. Psychotherapy is what we're going to be talking about over the next two days. Self-help, there are two harm reduction self-help or mutual help groups that I'll mention. Cultural, I, I'm going to talk in a minute about what I think of as um, a culture of harm reduction. Wouldn't it be neat to have a culture of harm reduction on college campuses or in our cities or across our nation where we're joined in, in a philosophy of harm reduction? Drug education. There's a drug education program for teens and for uh, young people, for college age people. Drug treatment. We can, we can infuse existing drug treatment uh, interventions with a harm reduction philosophy <clears throat> and parent support. As I said before, if we're going to be providing harm reduction interventions for drug users, parents and families also need to be educated and supported in a harm reduction perspective. So what would a culture of harm reduction look like? I mean, these are some of my ideas, but I would really invite everyone here to consider, you know, what would that look like? What would it consist of? It seems to me a wellness orientation. You know, thinking about wellness. You know, rather than thinking about ideals. Ideals are great. Running the marathon is great. But what about starting an exercise program? That would be one step. Or what about even buying a pair of running shoes, you know? Uh, or investigating the gym. You know, a wellness orientation, thinking about health, about diet, about exercise, about substance use from a, a health perspective. Thinking about the quality of individual and, and community life, respect for personal choice. Safety first is another key harm reduction idea I'm going to talk about in a minute as it relates to college students. We may, we may hope, we may wish you know, we may pray that our young people, our, our loved ones, don't engage in risky behavior. And we may certainly tell them why. But pragmatically, the reality is that many people will. So how can we think about safety first while we're having that conversation about the ultimate goals we would like people to pursue? Balance is a harm reduction concept personal responsibility, um, compassion for self and others, awareness, mindfulness, collaboration, collaborating, having collaborative relationships between family members, between parents and their uh, young loved ones on college campuses, having dialogue um, between administration and, and students, curiosity. So within that culture, we can think about education. I think education is a primary harm, you know, honest, science-based education is a primary harm reduction intervention. I think many of us know that there have been drug education programs in the past that have not been so honest and have um, turned off a lot of young people. So, but we have lots of information that we can share with uh, the community about risk related to substance use. Self-management skills, to the extent that people are vulnerable to having addic addictive problems because of self-management problems, teaching self-management, um, stress management, self-care focus, emotion management, mindfulness, 
Uh, imagine teaching these skills to children when they enter school. This is teaching res resilience that will really support people in um, reducing the risk associated with experimenting with substances. Peer moderation, harm reduction, and uh, wellness educators within peer groups. If we could, you know, identify um, people that are willing to take uh, some leadership around educating their peers. This is something that's happening among drug user groups on college campuses, um, in different settings. This can be a wonderful intervention. Student participation in you know, wellness councils on college campuses. The Good Samaritan policy. Do you have that here in the Philippines? Do you know what that is? No, no. OK. Um, the Good Samaritan policy is becoming increasingly accepted in communities across the United States. And that is a policy whereby if you are with an individual who is having a drug-related crisis, you can call for help, and you will not be liable to persecution, prosecution or persecution. Um, so that, you know, what we find very frequently is that when people are afraid to call for help because they're afraid for their legal safety, they frequently don't call for help and people die. But when you have a Good Samaritan policy, uh, people are much more likely to call for help and save lives. Very important policy to consider integrating. Free late night pickup service. Uh, this is particularly valuable on college campuses where um, you know, kids can call to be picked up at any hour of the night, um, no questions asked if they need to be escorted back to their campuses. And then moderation management or other support uh, groups that are harm reduction minded. I'm going to move pretty quickly, um, but then we'll, we'll have some time to discuss all of these and uh, <coughs> clarify them. So this is what I call the, the, the main pillars of public health harm reduction. As I mentioned, honest drug education, opiate substitution therapy. There's so much evidence to support the efficacy of these therapies for opiate dependent individuals. Um, and also, low threshold opiate substitution treatment. Just like the, the, the wet shelters I mentioned earlier. Uh, invite people to come into um, a shelter without having to commit to abstinence. They can use substances in their, the privacy of their uh, living quarters. Without any other intervention, you see uh, decreases in substance use, increased mental health. Similarly with opiate substitution treatment, if you make requirements that they take urine tests or that they go to counseling or that they go to groups or that they do other things, you're going to reduce the, the number of people who will want to be in those treatments. Now, if we can then flood those treatments with a whole range of services and make the services relevant and appealing to people's needs, people will more likely take advantage of them. So rather than making it compulsorily and a requirement of the treatment, Let's make minimal requirements and make maximal services available that people will actually want to access. Again, collaboration, personal responsibility, um, respecting the rights of the individual. Needle syringe programs. Uh, we talked about it before. Um, these have just um, had such dramatic uh, health um, you know, improvements in protecting people from uh, illness that I think that it's unconscionable that they're not more widely available, including in the United States, and it's primarily for ideological reasons rather than pragmatic, evidence-based um, you know, health science. Overdose prevention. Do you guys have naloxone here? No. Hmm. Naloxone is a drug that, that reverses overdose. 
it, uh, opiate overdose. And there are thousands of lives that have been saved in the last few years in the United States because they recently recognized at a federal level that overdose in the United States is at an epidemic uh, level. And so they've started to make naloxone more and more widely available, including teaching first responders, the police, you know, the emergency personnel, um, to carry naloxone and to be trained in how to administer it. Uh, and, I mean, there are some wonderful films about, you know, law enforcement people talking about how wonderful they feel to be in the position to save a life rather than to stand by and watch somebody die. The Good Samaritan Law we talked about. Now, here's one that is so controversial um, in the United States as well, which is the supervised injection facility. These are facilities that are medically supervised facilities where people can come in with drugs and inject under medical supervision. And um, in, in, in Vancouver, Canada, they have one of these, which is one of the first. And they have a safe injection facility on the ground floor, and they have a detox on the second floor. So think about it. People can come in and inject, and in some cases there are overdoses which can be reversed. So you have lots of lives that are being saved, and you have relationships with healthcare providers being established, which actually you know, enable people to become engaged in talking about their health and their substance use. And if they want, they can access harm reduction psychotherapy and they can access detox and rehab. So meeting people where they are begins that process and many people then go on to um, you know, seek treatment for their drug use, and their addiction. And the wonderful thing about all of these interventions is that they all have positive health effects and none of them are associated with increased drug use in the community. You know, the biggest charge or worry that people have is that if you, d if you offer these things, you're going to be giving people permission to use drugs. You'll be sending the wrong message. In fact, that is not the case. Um, we, have, we have recent evidence in um, Portugal, which decriminalized drug use, and they offer people treatment on demand, including these services. The 10-year outcome research is in. Drug use is down, more people are engaged in treatment, overdose is down. So the evidence is accumulating um, that we need to be moving in this direction. Now, this is um, an evidence-based intervention for college students, but it could be used in many different settings. Basics, brief alcohol screening and intervention for college students. It's a two-session intervention. You know, problem student in trouble with drinking, referred to the counseling center. The first session, they do an assessment. The second session, they give feedback. This is how severe it seems. This seemed to be the problems. This is how your drinking stacks up against your peers. Like you're in the 90th percentile, which many of these students don't know. They think that their drinking is normative. It's evidence-based. It's one of the most strongly empirically supported interventions. And it's shown to reduce drinking rates for years for many of the students that go through the program. Just a two-session intervention, which is harm reduction-minded because it just gives people feedback and, and gives them options and um, sends them on their way. Uh, it's behavioral and motivational interviewing. And motivational interviewing is a harm reduction approach because it doesn't take a stance on what your outcome should be. It just engages you and supports you in thinking through you know, your options, your ambivalence, your relationship to uh, the, the activity, the behavior. And it can be uh, delivered by 
professionals, but also by paraprofessionals or students that are trained in it. So it's, it's a wonderful thing um, that can be widely distributed for relatively low cost. Oh, and again, you've, you've got a relationship that's established so that if people continue to have difficulties or the difficulties uh, increase, um, they can come back uh, for referrals for further treatment, more intensive treatment as needed. Safety First, it's a, it's a, uh, a drug education program for parents and teens. It's a reality-based approach. You can find it at this website. Go to drugpolicy.org, safety first. <clears throat> it's really about um, uh, creating relationship, creating dialogue, uh, having honest um, discussions with kids about drug use and risk, supporting people in making responsible decisions, um, and it also has been found to be a very valuable intervention in reducing um, you know, teenage drug use. And parents love it because it's realistic. The basic idea is that prevention is funda fundamentally about caring, connected relationships. So rather than moving in in a panicked state when, when parents discover that their children are using drugs, the first line of intervention is how can you create a caring, mutually respectful relationship such that dialogue is possible and assessment is possible. I think for me that's one of the core tenets of harm reduction work is that we need to know what the nature of the problem is and what the complexities are that are involved with it before we offer interventions. And so teaching parents about how to take that stance can be very valuable. Establish trust, listen to what the teens have to say, create that safe relationship, be non-judgmental, which doesn't mean that you can't express your concerns, but um, also try to listen to what the, what the young person has to say. Learn as much about drugs as you can, so that when you're having that dialogue with your kids, it's an educated dialogue. It's not a you know, panic-stricken dialogue. And the education for parents can be so important to help them calm down, you know, so that um, they understand that drug use is not uh, the same, you know, experimental use is not the same as addiction. Discuss the child's strategy. Um, how do you think about risk? That's so important, you know, around drug use, around going out to parties, around going out at night. How do you think about risk? How can you stay safe? What's your strategy? What are the challenges? Um, now, let's see, maybe in the next five or 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk about harm reduction psychotherapy, <coughs> and then we'll open up the conversation. I know I'm covering a lot of ground quickly. But back in 1998, uh, Alan Marlatt invited a few clinicians who were experimenting with working with active drug users to um, participate, to contribute papers to a special issue of a journal on harm reduction. In 1998, the term harm reduction psychotherapy was coined in that journal. One of the contributors, Pat Denning, who has a center out in the Bay Area in San Francisco in the States. And I wrote the two books that really constitute the, the two pieces of literature. There have been a bunch of other papers that have been written. The brief history is that harm reduction was born in Europe in the 70s and 80s. And then, and, but it was this public health harm reduction in, in Amsterdam and then in England and then it got brought to Switzerland by the, the Dr. Hemick that I told you about earlier. In the late 80s and early 90s, a bunch of Americans went over to Europe and discovered harm reduction and brought it back to the United States. And then, as I said, in the 90s, a group of us, mostly psychologists, began to think about applying harm reduction to psychotherapy. 
and that's really uh, where this work evolves from. We could think about harm reduction psychotherapy as a general category of therapies that embrace these core harm reduction principles that I mentioned earlier. Reduce the harm without requiring abstinence, start where the person is, embrace small incremental change and collaboration. So, you know, motivational interviewing falls under that rubric, even though they may not call it a harm reduction therapy. As I said, I think those principles are best suited to enhance the therapeutic alliance and they can, they can facilitate the delivery of other evidence-based practices. So CBT can be offered within a harm reduction framework. Motivational interviewing can be offered as a harm reduction intervention or it can be used to direct people to abstinence which then makes it not a harm reduction intervention. Um, Residential care, I think, you know, um, rehabs can function under a harm reduction framework. Even if the rehab itself has an abstinence requirement, it doesn't mean that the clinician needs to presume to know what the patient needs. You can still work within a harm reduction framework within an abstinence setting. Or with teens, you know, who, you know, we all want to support them in not using drugs. But that doesn't mean the clinician needs to take that stance, but can be more on the side of helping the teen think through the risks and their relationship to substances. So harm reduction psychotherapy, as I said earlier, brings this therapeutic orientation to harm reduction settings um, and, a, and a harm reduction orientation to treatment. We've talked about all of this, the many paths to addiction, many paths to recovery, and that we're addressing the problem behavior in the context of a whole person in their context. So the, dom the domains of harm reduction therapy. I think there have been an, a, a lot of other splits within the field. You know, the, the cognitive behaviorists argue with the psychoanalysts who argue with the you know, mindfulness practitioners or the MI people. Um, I think you may get from our talk about complexity earlier that I think that the therapeutic alliance and relationship is the foundation. So that's one of the domains in a way that we need to continually be thinking about. Are we in alliance or are we in rupture? How do we keep ourselves in alliance? What is the basis for establishing the alliance and maintaining it throughout. The cognitive behavioral self-management focus is actually going to focus on the problem behavior specifically. What's problematic about it? Assessment. You know, what are positive change goals? What behaviors and cognitions will support positive change? How do we support people in making positive behavior change? In reworking maladaptive habits. So I think that that's, that, and, and that is actually one focus that has been part of traditional drug and alcohol treatment. They've been focused more on positive behavior change, working with urges, working with triggers, people, places, and things. All of that is really about behavioral, positive behavioral change. But the psychodynamic exploratory focus is then about having a space to look into the deep meaning, you know, the deep functions, the multiple meanings of that complex behavior. So both of these focuses are going to complement one another. They're not in, in, in contrast. You find as you begin working toward positive behavior change, the part of the person that's invested in the behavior is going to be in conflict. So we need to invite both of those focuses into the therapy. And of course, we need to be focusing on the body. Interesting, people take substances to change something in the body, to change something in their mood, in how they're feeling. And often, substances have a negative impact on the body. So I think we continually need to be thinking about, how's this body doing? You know, how are people feeling? Medical assessment, psychiatric assessment really needs to be a key part, self-care. Um, and social community. Many of our patients have been dislocated from communities, 
um, have been ostracized from society, and that contributes to the despair, the dysfunction, and the escalation of drug use. So um, thinking about people's relationships and how they're connected to communities is a key. So these are all kind of domains that I'm continually thinking about when I'm working with my patients. But now I want to bring it all together. Okay, and <clears throat> this is what we'll be doing the next two days. We'll be going into what I call the seven therapeutic tasks of my approach, my version of, of harm reduction therapy. Let's see if this will work. No? <laughs> Forget that. <laughs> so as I said, I think the first and most important domain is managing, establishing, and managing, maintaining the therapeutic alliance. Now think about the concept of starting where the patient is. In order to establish a relationship, a therapeutic alliance, we need to be in agreement about goals, strategy, and the quality of the bond. That's what the research tells us. And that the stronger the therapeutic alliance, the better the therapeutic outcomes. So that argues for me very much in support of this harm reduction framework, starting where the patient is. Then around that therapeutic alliance, a relationship develops. <clears throat> and that relationship is going to be uniquely based on th those two unique people. And that relationship then supports all of the rest of the therapeutic work. I think that we can think about the relationship as potentially healing itself. It's an agent of healing to the extent that people have had difficulties in their earlier relationships which are contributing to the problematic use. A relationship that can help rework those difficulties may actually address some of the basic roots of the addictive issue. Um, just a simple example of that is that, you know, to the extent that people have been traumatized um, have been left feeling you know, deeply mistrustful of others, and maybe particularly around their drug use, to the extent that they can enter into a relationship with you and be met by somebody who is not punitive, who's curious, who wants to be helpful, actually can offer a healing alternative experience that um, can send a message that relationships can be trusted and you are worthy of care, and you know, that can inspire uh, tremendous optimism, and, and then it sets the stage for enhancing self-management skills to the extent that people have had great difficulty in managing their, their feeling states and being able to remain self-aware, kind of mindful, uh, moment to moment. Um, we may have to actually very actively support people in developing better capacities to, to self-manage. Mindfulness, um, affect tolerance, that is the ability to sit with uncomfortable feelings, breathing techniques, self-talk, being able to monitor you know, the ways that you yell at yourself, the ways that you punish yourself, and kind of develop an inner dialogue that enables you to develop a kind of a more accepting attitude toward yourself. That can actually help people sit still with their addictive urges. And now all of that sets the stage for what we call assessment as treatment. Together in alliance with a patient that it now has some skills to sit still and, and observe oneself, it becomes possible for us to assess th what's problematic about substance use, the complex psychobiosocial factors, the meanings that the substance has, we can start parsing those issues out, identifying them, which then makes it possible to start goal setting around all of the relevant factors. Embracing ambivalence is a key because to the extent that people's substance use is um, meaningful, 
is adaptive, um, is in some way serving a life, uh, uh, maybe even life-saving function in their life, people are going to be deeply wedded to that substance in spite of the fact that it's problematic. So people are going to be ambivalent about change. And we want to invite the ambivalence into the room to help people sit with it so that we can consider new solutions. Simple example is if my substance use helps me with suicidal depression, that was what was part of that young man's story that I told at the beginning today uh, with HIV and depression. Um, despite the fact that the substance use is harmful, we may need to help address the depression, find an alternative solution to it before the patient will be ready to consider cutting back or stopping. Now, with you know, the assessment and um, bringing the ambivalence into the room, we can start thinking about harm reduction goal setting. We can goal set around reducing the risk of the substance. We can goal set around the co-occurring issues. So goals really emerge out of that assessment. And they're emerging out of the patient's experience. Um, and as goals become clear, we can start developing highly individualized personal plans that are going to address all of those multiple issues. Um, I wish we had time to go into all of this in much more depth, but maybe um, we'll have some time to discuss it. So I'm going to end right here um, so that we have a little time to talk. Um, I mentioned earlier that I've been training um, a, an, an organization that is called Housing Works, which is working in a very, very poor community in New York City, in Brooklyn, a formerly homeless, HIV-positive population. And uh, this is the comments about harm reduction that, that some of the staff, it's generally a very young group of counselors and social workers said. Halodia said, people, out, people are out there who don't think they can get help. It helps people to understand that you can have an addiction and you don't have to be judged and you don't have to stay out there. You can get help even while you're using. That's her definition. Brian said, we're allowing people to live safer lives. Megan said, allowing people to determine where they want to go and how they want to get there. Person-centered, individual-centered. And Alicia said, hope. So we've covered a lot of ground in four hours. Uh, and I realize we haven't had much time to go into much depth. But um, I'm glad we all made it through. And uh, I'd like to open the floor and see what people are sitting with. You know, one of the things that I do in my trainings, I like to do, and I usually do, in my trainings and my groups, I run harm reduction groups, is do a checkout. Now, we certainly don't have time here for everybody to check out, but I find it very useful to invite people to think about you know, what you've experienced today, what you're sitting with, what thoughts, feelings, what are you taking away from today that might be valuable or that you might think about trying out in your setting. What might you want to just share with the group uh, about the day? And um, let's see where the mic is. Maybe we can. <laughs>